This is Six African Trade Talks. Six African Trade Talks is a media partner of Intra Africa Trade Fair, an initiative of Afrexim Bank in collaboration with the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat and the African Union. In this episode, our guest is Judith Lee. Judith is the director of programs at the Westerwell Foundation. Tell us a little bit about your journey and experience with investment and entrepreneurship in Africa. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, it started off pretty in a pretty interesting way. So I'm actually Canadian, born in China. And so I had never come into contact with Africa as a continent until much later when I was in university. And during a school competition, they asked us, how can you come up with a business model that can improve the lives of 1 million people within the next 10 years. I started researching what are the most high potential markets, the most high potential impact locations as well. And yeah, we stumbled upon this one social problem, which is cooking indoors with wood fuel, uh, wood charcoal, which happens actually in many continents, a lot in sub-Saharan Africa, but also Asia and Latin America. So this was the issue we wanted to tackle. So we got pretty deep into R&D and also piloting of a social startup where we would use agricultural waste and our own machines to replace cooking charcoal with cooking briquettes that were better for your health and better for the environment. So this took me on a two-year journey through Kenya. My team also piloted in Cameroon at the time. And in the end, we realized we didn't have enough experience. So we ended up transferring the tech and part of the funds that we managed to raise to local partners. But what it did teach me was, was to get a roadmap for myself and to get a, let's say, a vocational path for myself, which I think is a really lucky thing to have at the beginning of your professional career. So I knew that Africa was a continent of great potential I knew that culturally and demographically, it's just waiting to get fired up and become the next frontier business-wise and societally as well. I ended up going through a journey to improve myself and my knowledge about entrepreneurship, about Africa. And I told myself I would get myself to the point where the next startup I found, it would be a, a great success. So what I actually did was I knew I was not so good at sales, so I joined a French unicorn to to become a salesperson and hone those skills. Then I knew also I was lacking connections in the industry. So then I joined an impact consulting firm here in Berlin, and I ended up learning so much about how the industry works, who you should talk to. And finally, I decided two years ago to join the Vestivella Foundation in order to take on a more entrepreneurial, a more leadership role in order to advance their portfolio of entrepreneurship support programs. And I'm still hopefully one day going to found, but long story short, that's how, you know, the fire ignited within me for the African continent. Wow. What a journey, inspiring journey. And I love the places you started, but you speak about firewood and coming up with cleaner cooking models. Mm -hmm. I have been involved in LPG and I remember a few years ago going for the LPG Association conference in Nairobi. That was my first time in Nairobi. And yeah, it's, it's amazing how impact can happen in this space and how we can help save lives. So, so yeah, thank you very much for sharing your journey. Let, ch ch tell us more, sorry, tell us a little bit more about Westerwell Foundation and the entrepreneurship programs that you do? Definitely. The Vestavella Foundation was started 10 years ago by Dr. Vito Vestavella, our namesake. So he was the foreign minister at the time and a vice chancellor of Germany. And he actually was involved heavily on the African continent within his political function. So when he stepped away from his political career, he decided to continue doing something worthwhile and he thought that entrepreneurship would actually be the best vehicle for economic and social development. That's how we got our mission, which is to uplift emerging markets through empowered entrepreneurship. 
Fast forward to today, we're actually working on several key areas. The first one being setting up co-working spaces and entrepreneurship hubs across Africa. So currently we have entrepreneurship hubs in Kigali, in Tunis, and in Arusha. And we're looking to expand at a rate of one hub per year, at least in the near future. So currently we're looking into Benin, looking into Namibia, looking into Zambia as our next locations. And we're always looking for these ecosystems where there's still a huge need for entrepreneurship support organizations. If you look at Nairobi or if you look at Lagos, there's already a thriving ecosystem there. So many successful startups as well as investors who are entering the market. So there's less need for an NGO approach. We're looking at these ecosystems where there's still a need for all of the players to step up in order to build a thriving ecosystem. And that's where the programs come in. We try to offer support in terms of capacity building, access to networks, access to finance for entrepreneurs and also ecosystem players so that the entire entrepreneurship ecosystem can advance and progress. And in this way, support the entrepreneurs to reach their dreams and to reach their professional potential. And so today we, for example, today we have a whole portfolio of programs. Back in 2022, we managed to have 729 entrepreneurs go through our programs. And that was through 17 different programs. And we're still trying to build more portfolios from ideation to growth stage to continue to support these entrepreneurs. Quite impactful. And the countries that you're going to also will definitely be on the radar as <laughs> countries that are, that, are, that are doing well in entrepreneurship. A few mm -hmm. years ago, people wouldn't go to Nigeria or to Kenya, but today those are the top, some mm -hmm. of the top markets in terms of entrepreneurship. So we will also take lessons from you uh, in terms of where to go, where's the next entrepreneurship. <laughs> All right. What lessons can you share that can help startups in Africa based on your experience? So I think there is a lot regarding mindset and regarding expectation management that can be shared uh, from a perspective of European, African, and global NGO, which we are. Essentially, the first thing would be regarding access to finance. One of the most asked for resources from our entrepreneurs is, of course, funding. But a lot of our entrepreneurs, especially the first-time founders, come in with this expectation that entrepreneurship might be the easy way to get fast cash. And I just think this is so wrong because if anything, entrepreneurs are the most resilient people I know and the most hardworking individuals I know. And I think there's much easier ways to get cash and fast than entrepreneurship. So the first mindset shift, I think, is for entrepreneurs to realize that investors are here to invest in startups that are going somewhere and will give them a return on investment or return on impact. And so with this in mind, entrepreneurs need to think first and foremost about how they're going to make money through their business model. And along the way, they're going to get the investment from investors. Because if there's one secret that I learned through our experts and investors, it's that the investors will not want to be chased. They want to be the ones chasing. They want to see the new, newest talents, the newest models, and all fight for the same few entrepreneurs to invest in. They don't want to be the ones getting chased by entrepreneurs who are desperate for money. So think about first and foremost, not having this fundraising as your final goal, but rather as a means to an end to building this amazing business that everyone will want to work with and invest in. Secondly, I've realized that networks are everything. One of the biggest pities and also biggest opportunities that I see with some of the African entrepreneurs we work with is that they have the potential in terms of talent, in terms of vision, but because they don't have the networks and by networks, regional networks, Pan-African networks, global networks, 
and access to investors and access to customers and access to resources, because they don't have this, they're forced to be playing in a very small league. And I think the entrepreneurs really need to start looking at which networks will bring them to the next stage in terms of scalability and in terms of access to opportunities. And very finally, what I very often see in entrepreneurs, especially in Africa, is that there is a super strong hustling culture. Everyone is so dynamic and it's so motivating to see. However, there is very little structure when it comes to the way that a lot of our early stage entrepreneurs approach their business. And as a result, they end up shooting themselves in the foot because they see opportunities everywhere. And so they're going to start developing maybe 10 business models and 10 markets at the same time, multiple startups at the same time, instead of focusing on doing one thing, capturing one market, making one product really good and scalable. So I see a lot of founders burning themselves up, burning themselves out to follow so many different leads and opportunities when I think if they would bring more structure and discipline to perfecting one particularly strong market and finding product market fit over there, it would be potentially much easier for them to achieve the success that they're looking for. Quite some interesting insights there. And uh, the structure one also stands out because I remember last year some in August when I was at the London Stock Exchange, one of the people they had a meeting with said to me, African entrepreneurs have got great ideas, great business models and everything, but unstructured. And no one is going to come and fund this. So you really bring out something that is very important and uh, important insights. Any travel experience that you'd like to share? Any lessons from your travel experience and impact of technology? Yeah, I think definitely COVID has shaped the way that business is being done right now. I actually came into my job right after COVID. So back in 2021, and immediately it became apparent to me that it was possible to do remote work as a very closely knit and well aligned team. So to give you some context, right now within the programs team, we have local program managers and head of programs in each of the location. And a lot of things are being aligned with our headquarters here in Berlin, all online. And so on a daily basis, I will be having calls with at least three different locations, if not more, with our other partners. And it's all happening through technology. And however, I realized that a hybrid model is probably the best way to go in this in this new working environment. So it's still important for me once every three to six months to travel to each of our local hubs in order to connect with the team members. And there are some things that you can't say online and some bonds that you can't do unless you're you know, sitting across from the person or having a, a uh, an in-person event. What I've learned recently is that, yes, it's very much possible to have a well-functioning remote team through the impact of technology. However, it's still important and frankly, much nicer for humans to connect in person as well. Certainly. I think we're blessed to have a hybrid now in our lifetime. Before we continue, I'd like to hear a word from our sponsors. All right. Judy, so Based on your experience, what can you share with international investors or diaspora, those that want to come in and operate in Africa? Yeah, so I would highly encourage anybody who has an interest to invest in Africa to go check it out through research and also to physically go to the place because it's just a different world when it comes to especially international investors who who don't have a connection to the continent originally. I think it's a very high risk, high reward market as it is now. And it definitely takes a lot of time to develop that deep understanding. Tricks and tips that I would share are number one, that actually the market itself is probably really suitable for the current investment climate in terms of there is a potential for faster returns. And a lot of the African startups that I see have lower costs. 
and higher profitability ratio than, let's say, for example, European startups, just by nature of there being less access to financing. And thus, this entrepreneurial hustling spirit, as I previously talked about, kicks in and people are able to make something with very little resources to begin with. And so that's actually perfect for the what investors are looking at right now around the world in terms of investment. Going forward, I think trust is key when it comes to putting money into a startup. So it definitely would be great for international investors and the diaspora to, as I said, go personally and meet in person because that's how you can establish trust beyond just the spreadsheets. Uh, it's really important to be in the market in order to see what's the context that the entrepreneur is coming from. Because I've seen a lot of investors get freaked out or totally not understand why an entrepreneur is behaving a certain way or taking a certain course of action. But then when they go to the market and they speak with the ecosystem, they realize that actually this was the most logical and most business savvy decision that the entrepreneur could have made. And so I think it's very important to be able to check in operationally to make sure that that trust is, is built and merited and also to be mindful of the context of the local ecosystem or the local culture and therefore understand the entrepreneurs and therefore invest in a smart way. And then finally, I think it's really important for investors to figure out the legal framework in which they are going to funnel their money to Africa. Because I've spoken with a lot of investors, and even if they have the interest, they don't know how to get their money in and out of certain countries within Africa. And it's because sometimes the regulations are not yet in place. And it's because sometimes the regulations change very quickly. And this is a very high risk scenario for investors that are looking for return on investment or even just to keep their money going for impact purposes. It's really hard to not have this visibility on the local regulations. So there are a lot of resources out there for investors to understand more about the different markets in Africa and the different legal and regulatory landscapes. So I really highly recommend for investors to find a very sustainable approach legally and administratively to investing within Africa. And then I think with these three, honestly, there's just so much potential there. I, it's a re very rewarding experience. Certainly plenty opportunities on the continent. Thank you for sharing those insights. What areas do most of your entrepreneurs come from? So our entrepreneurs are actually sector agnostic and stage agnostic. We, as we take an entrepreneurial, sorry, as we take an ecosystem approach, it's really important for us to provide opportunities to a variety of entrepreneurs. And so beyond Africa, we even have entrepreneurs from other emerging markets, including Asia and Latin America as well. However, our focus remain on our African entrepreneurship hubs and our Pan-African programs. We have seen, however, in each of our ecosystems, there becomes a lot of themes pop up in terms of what the local gaps are and what entrepreneurs tend to go towards in terms of innovation. So I'll give an example. In Arusha, we see a lot of entrepreneurs leaning towards agriculture. And that makes sense because Arusha has such a high agricultural economy locally. So it makes sense that there is a lot of me and a gap for innovation within the agricultural sphere. And so in each of our ecosystems, we will have these themes that keep on coming up where we have to put more emphasis and support. So in general, we have a huge focus on climate in order to fulfill our goal towards sustainability. We have a huge focus also on female entrepreneurship in order to support our goal of inclusion. And then finally, just in general, we're always looking for entrepreneurs who are scalable. And in this way, they can take advantage of our Pan-African and International Investment Readiness programs. Thank you. I'm sure some entrepreneurs that listen to our podcast are hearing you. 
So thank you very much for sharing. What are your thoughts about grant funding? Yeah, so this is actually, I would say, one of my biggest areas of expertise. I have probably cumulatively helped to fundraise over two million in grant funding throughout my career. And I actually do a two hour expert talk on this. So I can probably go on for a really long time. But I think if it comes to the current status quo of grant funding in Africa for entrepreneurs, what I would say is I generally don't recommend entrepreneurs to go for grant funding because it goes really in the direction of then NGO and a non-private sector approach. And also there's a lot of strings attached to grant fundraising. For example, there's a longer lead time than closing a deal with a VC. And there's many more reporting guidelines and much less ability for entrepreneurs to pivot, which is very necessary for a healthy startup. However, in the case of Africa, I think there is still much need for fund grant funding. And that's because, especially for early stage entrepreneurs, there are so little opportunities to find alternative methods of investment and financing that grant funding is almost the only option that most entrepreneurs have in the early stage. So I think that very much we still need more grant funding more any times any types of investment and cash to entrepreneurs in africa but hopefully as the private sector develops more vehicles for entrepreneur support and access to finance hopefully also the reliance on grant funding can start decreasing amongst entrepreneurs interesting and you said you'd take long you'd go on and on but Example of entrepreneurs who have gotten grant funding. Yeah, so most of the entrepreneurs who get grant funding are impact entrepreneurs. I see a lot of, and in line with our focus as well, a lot of funds that focus on actually female entrepreneurs and climate entrepreneurs. So there's a lot of funds out there, such as even right now, what's open is the ITC Youth Ecopreneur Award. You have the Yemen's Foundation that uh, habitually opens up grant fundraising in the field of impact. And yeah, I mean, I could, again, probably check my LinkedIn if you want more resources. But I also don't want to name drop certain entrepreneurs because we have so many of our entrepreneurs who do uh, get fundraising. I think usually they also announce it on social media. But yeah, usually it's in, within the field of impact. Interesting. Thank you very much. For for sharing. Let's talk about networks. Any network recommendations? What would you recommend our entrepreneurs? Yes. So, of course, the first thing that I would recommend is the Vestavella Foundation. We have a community right now of 900 entrepreneurs, investors, mentors, and other supporters. And you can always reach out on LinkedIn to myself or find all of our social media handles on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, through our website. So you can always find new ways to join us, whether as an entrepreneur, as an investor, or as a supporter. I also recommend other trade and startup networks for entrepreneurs. And one good example is the ITC Yay community. That's the International Trade Center Yay community. And that's also a, an online community and resource for young entrepreneurs and business owners from around the world, and they focus on trade. So it's actually a great way to get the right opportunities. In terms of investors, I highly recommend, especially talking about international investors, diaspora, and people who are just getting started. I think in Africa, business angel networks are really a great way to get started because they put a lot of emphasis on sourcing deals together, building that trust I was talking about, and investing together so that you can decrease the risk and just get your appetite started. Some business angel networks include ABAN, so the African Business Angels Network, also NIBAN, the Nairobi Business Angels Network, and just about every single country or ecosystem has their own network. So I think that's a great way to get started. And then finally, for entrepreneurship support organizations, there's also a lot of networks who bring huge value in terms of opportunity and knowledge sharing. 
Just to name a few, you have Afrolabs supporting entrepreneurship support organizations across Africa. You also have Climate Kick, and this is a global network that started in Europe in order to support accelerators and incubators for climate change specifically, climate innovation specifically. And you also have the Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs. It's another sustainability-focused network for intermediaries and entrepreneurship support organizations. As I said earlier on, I think networks are really the greatest way to get started in a smart way to get involved in the ecosystem. Yeah, just reach out. And I think any of these networks would be happy to offer their resources. To support our show, please leave a review and share this episode. You can also connect with us on social media using the handles in our show notes or visit our website, scixpodcast.africa. See you next time.